But here's how it started. I was living in Memphis, and I attended a gospel meeting, so a lectureship in West Memphis, Arkansas, with Harold Red, who will be here tomorrow. On that lecture, Brother Johnny Lawrence was one of the presenters. And I picked up a tremendous piece of wisdom. There was a presenter before Brother Lawrence, and he had to leave after his presentation. There was an open forum, and there were questions. So a person stood up and asked Brother Lawrence a question about the other man's sermon. Um, <laughs> Brother Lawrence said, I learned years ago that people answer their own questions. All right. He said, I'll get you his number and you can call him. <laughs> that proved to be a very, very valuable piece of wisdom. Brother Lawrence was on the program but Brother Props had ridden over there with him. Right? Mm. So I had a chance to meet them for the first time and we stood outside and talked a while. Some months later, my job, I transferred to Jonesboro. I was working for the telephone company and they sent me here to Little Rock for training. And I called both of those men that we can spend some time with them as a matter of fact, Brother Lawrence brought me out here to this location mm. before the building was put up. Right. Matter of fact, when he brought me out, it was right after someone had stolen some of the <laughs> materials that had been brought on location. Some of you remember that. Yes, sir. Okay. But now, this 39-year relationship started because I was supporting a lectureship at another church. All right. All right. It's all right. If I had not been supporting a lectureship at another church, I would have not met them, and this 39-year relationship would not have taken place. I said that to say, support what's taking place mm -hmm. in, in other locations. You just never know. Yes, sir. You might start a 39-year <laughs> relationship. That's all right. It has been wonderful. <laughs> I'd love to just take my time and tell you all the wonderful things that I've learned and gained from being affiliated with you, but that's not what they brought me here for. So be turning in your Bible to the book of Isaiah chapter 53. And if you want to go ahead and get a little advanced, place something in your Bible at Mark chapter 10 and Luke chapter 18. We'll spend our time in those three sections. The information sent to me by his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53, 3. I feel despised and rejected. Help for people who do not feel accepted, loved or appreciated, who are scorned or made to feel unworthy or thrown away and feel like nobody. All right. Those are the people we're going to help today. All right. Yes, All right. Isaiah 53 and verse 3. He was despised. I'm reading from the New American Standard. He was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. In the text, God introduced his people to their suffering Savior. Isaiah gives us insight into the suffering Savior. 
but those to whom he came to heal refused to even look upon him. The closest illustration I can give to you to help you begin to internalize the depth of that pain. Have you ever helped someone went out of your way and then after having done all of that, they had the audacity to say to you, nobody cares about me. There was a friend of mine who worked for EMT, Emergency Service, in Gainesville, Florida. He said there were some people who refused to allow him to minister to, to help them when they had an automobile accident if something had happened. He said because of his skin color. There have been times that people have said, I'd rather my uncle die than for you to touch him. So there have been occasions when the policeman would have to make people who had been in an automobile accident allow him to assist them. That's some kind of rejection. They rejected Jesus because they despised him. And they despised him because they rejected him. All right. Social acceptance rates high on our human needs. I know sometimes we say to people, all I need is God. God and I can make it. But can I tell you that God has created us to be social beings. Yes, yes. And though you may believe and you may think that you are just fine without people, whenever you hear that, you can rest assured those people have been deeply hurt. And so that's their protective mechanism. But that is absolutely not the way God intended it. God could have had us born out of an egg and we live isolated. But he placed us in a family yes, sir. with mother and father. As a matter of fact, God wanted us to have socialization so much that he required that mother and father become husband and wife and remain there with the children. Amen. 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 Social acceptance rates high. The famed psychologist Abraham Maslow in his scale of human needs places love and social acceptance at a three on a scale of one to five. There is a need for social acceptance. But what happens when we are socially rejected? Help. Jesus models for us. And we're going to learn today how to do that. There are some people in this world that has been hurt. And I mean deeply hurt. And I don't mean people who just didn't speak loud enough for you to hear them when you came to the assembly. But there are some people who've been hurt in this world. And there are some people who are still hurting in this world. And there are some people that have been intentionally hurt in this world. Recently, I corresponded with a young man who was three years old when his father murdered a man and went to prison. Mm. How old did I say the boy was? He was three. His daddy went to prison for 12 years. When his father came home from prison, moved back into the house with his mother, his mother put the boy and his twin sister out of the house. Wow. Wow. 
Wow. Now you thought you went through something because your mother wouldn't let you have two slices of cake. Right? <laughs> Can you imagine a 15 year old boy and his twin sister having to fend for themselves? His daddy came home and his mother put him out. But I am so glad to report he learned well and he's done well. Praise the Lord. He's graduated from college. As a matter of fact, I met him because I am engaged in doing his premarital counseling. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. And, and from that type of social rejection, there are some people who have been hurt. And sometimes those are the people that we interact with, but we don't know their story. Mm -hmm. And since we don't know their story, we don't know how to respond. Mm -hmm. Jesus models for us how to deal with rejection and being despised. Isaiah gives us a picture of Jesus from the historical perspective. But then when we go into the New Testament, we will actually see how it works. He teaches us how to behave. We're going to look at two sightings of Jesus in the New Testament. And then this presentation is yours. The first sighting is Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And verse number 33. Mark chapter 10. And verse number 33. The first sighting we want to look at. We want to pull something out of here that's going to bless your life. Say, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. This is Jesus. We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, scourge him, kill him, and three days later he will rise again. See, Jesus is actually connecting again to what Isaiah has said in chapter 53 and verse number 3. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit one on your right, one on your left, in your glory. Underscore that in your mind, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism of which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John, calling them to himself. Jesus said to them, you know that those who recognize as rulers of the Gentiles, Lord, it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now notice verse number 46. Then there came to Jericho, and he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, and a large crowd of blind beggar named Bartimaeus. All right. Now notice. When Jesus got through talking about what's going to happen in Jerusalem in Mark, the story culminates into blind Bartimaeus' story. We're going to come back and make the connection there in just a moment. But now, here's what I want to tell you. We learn from the Mark 10 story that some rejection comes because people are just sinfully or selfishly sinful. All right. Mm. Some people will hurt you and harm you because they are selfishly sinful. Did you notice the story? The disciples said to Jesus, we want to sit on the right, on the left, in your glory. When you get your last mortgage paid, I want to move in. <laughs> yeah. 
call me after the dessert is ready. All right, I can got you. Now, I don't want to come. I don't want to stir the batter, prepare it. I don't want to peel the potatoes. But call me when everything is ready. Sinfully selfish. All right. I want to sit on the right. Let my brother sit on the left. In your glory. In your glory. I don't want to be a part of your story. I just want to be in your glory. Right. Mm, 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 mm. Sinfully selfish. Oh people are hurt every day. Right. Because people are sinfully selfish. Now, let's go to the second side here. Luke chapter 18. Keep remembering that now. Don't forget anything I say. Luke chapter 18. <laughs> Luke chapter 18. Verse number 31. We pick up the second sight. Luke chapter 18 and verse number 31. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, The whole we're going up to where? Jerusalem. Now this is the same thing he said back in Mark 10. Both of these are connected to Isaiah 53. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and mistreated, spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things. And the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Now look at verse 35. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind, you notice how both of these sightings transition into the blind Bartimaeus story. Mm. When Jesus begins to apply for his disciples what Isaiah said, he ended both stories with the blind Bartimaeus story. We'll tell you the significance of that in just a moment. Some people will harm you because they are selfishly sinful. But some rejection comes from those who are intelligently ignorant. <laughs> some harm comes from people who are intelligently ignorant. Listen, notice in the text, the text said they did not understand Jesus is saying. Why did they not understand what he said? If you're taking notes, Luke chapter 10, verse 21, Matthew chapter 11, and verse 25, we don't have time to go read that. The text said that Jesus hid some things from those who were intelligently wise. So why is it that they did not understand what he was saying? They were intelligently ignorant. All right. All right. Brother N.L. Evans used to say, you're too intelligent to tell me you don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Now, that was yes, his sir. nice way of saying, yes, sir. you're being intelligently ignorant. <laughs> they couldn't understand it. Why? Because God hid it from them. Why? They were so intelligent. So some people harm us because they are selfishly sinful and some are intelligently ignorant. But in either case, Jesus models for us how to respond. Now, both of these sightings transition into the blind Bartimaeus story. What do we learn from that? What do we do when people bruise us? Mm. When they intentionally bruise us? What do you do? What do you do when your children bruise you? What do you do when your spouse bruises you? What do you do when you find out that your grandchildren have emptied your bank account and won't even come over to see you? What do you do when your preacher bruise you? Uh, yeah. What do you do when you go 
to your preacher in private counsel and then it's the part of his sermon the next Sunday and everybody knows who it is. What do you do when you have helped them when their daughter had her third child out of wedlock and now your child is having their first one and they are making mockery of you? What do you do? How do you handle that? Talk to Jesus models for us how to handle it and how to handle it healthily. Now let's go back uh, to the blind Bartimaeus story. Let's, let's go down a little further in verse 35. Verse 35. Right there in Luke 18. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He called out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Yes. All right, here's the first thing you do. Are you ready for this? Oh, yeah. You're not ready? I mean, go back and preach this over again. You're not ready? You ready for this? Yeah. They're over, he's over on this side. They're ready. Yeah, he, he's ready over here. This is the side that went to bed early last night. <laughs> now, this must be the party side over here. Y'all was up late watching TV, okay? <laughs> Okay. You ready for this? All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, here's what you do. Now, what Jesus does, he gives us a functional solution to every dilemma. Whatever the dilemma is, he gives us a functional solution that is within reach. All right. Now, here's the very first thing you do when people are mistreating you, when you're rejected, when you are despised. Here's what you do. Go Bless Amen. those who know who you are. Bless them. All right. Go bless those who know who you are. Right. They recognize your value. Yes. Now watch the blind Bartimaeus story. What does Bartimaeus say? He said, Jesus. Yeah. Now notice, Jesus has just got through rehearsing how he will be rejected. And then he tells the Bartimaeus experience. What does Bartimaeus say? Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? Matthew 1 and verse 21, you'll give birth to a son. He'll be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Bartimaeus recognized who Jesus was. And he recognized his value. Listen, when people bruise you, go find someone who knows who you are, who recognized your value, and bless them. Now, I really wish we had about 30 minutes to kind of take questions on this so we can talk about how to actually apply that. If you have a question about that, you can call me at any point, email me or something, and we'll walk you through that very specifically. Go bless someone who knows who you are. Do you know what aggravates us the most? We spend too much time trying to persuade people who already know. But they are unwilling to admit. Mm. Yes, sir. Mm. That's frustrating. A person already knows, but they have made up in their mind, I'm not going to admit it. So I don't care what you say, guess what? They are never going to admit it. Right. And you become frustrated and frustrated and more frustrated trying to get them to admit it. All right, so when you're bruised, what are you supposed to do? 
go bless someone who knows who you are and they recognize your value. That's exactly what Jesus did. He left the discussion with the disciples and went and did what? Bless Bartimaeus. Okay? Second thing. First thing we want to do is go bless those who know who you are and recognize your value. What time was we in? 9.40? Okay, so I got 12 minutes. All right. Number two. Go bless those who know how you got there. Go bless those who know how you got there. Let's go back to the blind Bartimaeus story. What does Bartimaeus say? He said, Jesus, son of David. Well, what does that mean? The term son of David is a messianic title. Yes, yes, yes. Bartimaeus was saying, I not only know who you are, but I know how you got there. Mm. You got to be Jesus because you have come through the lineage of David. See, people who know how you got there, they will celebrate you, not just tolerate you. Mm. So, mm. We spend too much time with people who tolerate us. Right. Spend time with people who celebrate you. Right. Yeah. Go bless someone who knows who you are, they recognize your value, Go bless someone who knows how you got there. They will celebrate you, not tolerate you. Celebrate you. Who celebrates you? Who celebrates you? Who just tolerates you? <laughs> who really celebrates you? Yeah. Who celebrates you? You know, one of the reasons Brother Lawrence and I became very good friends, I was just starting out in ministry, and he celebrated me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, my first preacher perk, Brother Lawrence, took me to Red Lobster. <laughs> first time in my life anyone had ever bought me a meal other than my dad. <laughs> Man, I thought I was somebody special. <laughs> Brother Lawrence celebrated me. Now, when you're celebrated, you have to keep celebrating someone else. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So guess what? I celebrate Sister Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, on Mother's Day, I send her a Red Lobster gift card. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I'm late this year. I want to get on time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last year I didn't get her card to her until November. <laughs> I did well, I just didn't get it there in time. And, 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 I, and I give her a card large enough so her daughter can take her. <laughs> it won't have to pay. And I do that every year. Praise the Lord. That's Listen, all right. Celebrate. Who celebrates you? See, there are two categories of people. There are investors, people who celebrate you, and then there are consumers. Mm -hmm. Those are people who are taking out of you. Mm -hmm. And if you spend all of your time with consumers, you will end up being depleted. Mercy, Lord. Have mercy. Have mercy. So what Jesus did, he went and spent time blessing someone who knew who he was, how he got there. Now, why is that so important? Here's what blessing other people will do. It removes the focus from yourself. You ever wondered why grandmother could get up out of the bed, arthritis, rheumatism, pain, and etc., and go in the kitchen and cook for all of the family members? Her focus was on the grandchildren. Yes. So she forgot about her pain for a while. Mm. So learning to bless other people takes the focus off of ourselves. 
And when you take the focus off of yourself, you stop registering the maximum pain. All right. All right. You know, I learned early. If, if, you know, my daddy said if you, you know, if, if, if we were taking a splinter out of your finger, don't look. How <laughs> many of you heard that? You know, when, when they're taking some blood from me, I don't look at them. You know, they, I come out there and a long needle. I don't want to see it. <laughs> Listen, I went to Los Angeles to do a seminar. And I was I come down that morning to check out and head back to Atlanta then. And I looked up on the television and there had been a, a plane accident on the runway. Mm. I turned my back. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't need to be looking up at a plane accident. I'm fixing to go out and uh, go down that same runway in a minute. Yeah. I didn't say anything about it. I didn't look at it anymore. Once we landed in it left, I said to the person sitting next to you, did you hear about that accident? <laughs> See, I didn't need to focus on that. So what I'm trying to tell you is that when people reject you, you do not have the capacity to make them quit. But you do have the capacity to change your focus. Amen. Amen. So you change your focus, and then it helps you to move away from registering the maximum amount of the pain. Here's another little thing to illustrate that. If you ever own a boat, you know the boats up and down, and you know people get seasick. People are looking out. Now what you do is you look at a spot on the boat. Yeah that's moving with you and that makes it look like it's not moving and so you don't become nuts. All right. You have to change your focus. Yeah. Yeah. But see, if you're looking at something stationary, you then really see how much you're weaving. Yeah. What if you look at a spot on the boat? It's weaving with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't register so much. So you don't have the capacity to make people accept you. You cannot make folk like you. You cannot make them accept you. But you can change your focus. Right. When you change your focus, it'll reduce the intensity of the pain. Right. I wish I could tell you that people are going to stop rejecting you. I wish I could tell you that. But if I do, it won't be true. Mm. Yeah. I wish I could tell you that there's a magic wand to wave and the pain will go away. But if I tell you that, it will not be true. But I can tell you this and it will be true. When you are rejected, go bless someone who knows who you are. Go bless someone who knows who you are and they appreciate your value. Go bless someone who knows who you are and they appreciate your value. Go bless someone who knows how you got there. See, when people know what you've done to get there, they have a greater probability of appreciating who you are and what you've done. So go bless someone. Now notice, here is the way to deal with rejection. You deal with rejection by blessing. Yeah. Now, where I came from, blessing had two meanings. It had a church meaning. <laughs> And it had an everyday meeting. Mm -hmm. All right. yes, sir. The everyday meeting was, I'm blessing them out. <laughs> <laughs> See, we keep trying to respond to our rejection by blessing people out. No. Bless. Do something good. Here's something you'll notice in the life of Jesus. Every time he was harmed, every time he was bruised, every time he was attacked, he simply moved closer to blessing other people. 
See, don't turn your focus inwardly. Turn your focus outwardly. Go bless someone. What rejection are you feeling at this moment? What rejection have you experienced? How have you been bruised recently? What lingering bruise just keeps painting your memory? Go bless someone else. Go bless someone else. Take the focus off of yourself. Stop fussing with the people who are bruising you. Go bless someone else. Amen. It's amazing how good you will feel when you go bless someone else. Amen. Bless someone who knows who you are and what your value is. Amen. Bless someone who knows how you got there. Mm -hmm. They will celebrate you, yeah. not just yeah. tolerate you. That's all right. Thank you. Amen. 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 Man, we all do a good start. Amen. Amen. We all do a wonderful, wonderful yes. start. Thank you so, so, so much, John, uh, for all this. Your insight of the scriptures yes. and also in helping us in our everyday walk with the Lord. Amen. Uh, before we dismiss, I want to give you uh, some, some instructions. Uh, first of all, uh, Brother Greg Seller, to the men who will be serving this morning at worship during the worship hour, Brother, Brother Greg Seller would like to meet with you in the conference room down the hall to the right. Just for a moment, you just want to make sure that everything is in place and that things will go smooth. Uh, what we're going to do, we, we, we have a, we, we try to maintain a, a degree of security and safety here uh, at McAlvin. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our breakout sessions at this time. So we're going to give you time to get there. But we want you to please move to the areas expeditiously. First of all, to the sisters you will remain here in the auditorium. So what we would like you to do, uh, you will hear more about your speaker, but what we want you to do is we want you to sit like family. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me take that back. Now, now sit together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, family, family don't eat like we did, John. You know, you, you, yes, mama sir. said it's time to eat. Everybody came together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Said dinner ready, somebody get their plate, they go to the watch the TV, right. so I'm going yeah. to be in room. Yeah. You know, they just go all over the place. But what we'd like for you to do is to, as you feast together on God's word, we want you to sit together. Now, to our brothers, you will be meeting in the in the multipurpose building or the gymnasium that's been set up for your 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 uh, your session this morning. And we're just glad that Brother John has consented to to working with us in that men's workshop this morning. That's all right. So brothers, don't don't miss that. Don't miss that. You see, John's gonna tell you what the Bible says, but he's also gonna tell you how to do what he says. Right. I'll say that again. Yes, John's gonna tell you what the Bible <laughs> says, then he's gonna tell you how to do what the Bible mm -hmm. says. Now, also to our youth, sessions has been prepared for you. What you will do is you go out these doors, you just go around, right to the education building to the leadership conference center brother mitchell and his team have everything set up and ready for you to go there so we want you to please make sure that you go by the registration table that's there and get registered uh, for the for the lectureship and what's going to transpire so again we thank you for being a part of this year's uh, lectureship god bless you and at this time you can Consider yourselves dismissed again. Let's go straight down the hallway. Yes, go straight down the hallway. There's going to be some men to show you how to get there. Just go straight down the hallway, brothers, and they will get you to where you need to be. So you consider yourselves dismissed.